Okay. So lama, different. Okay. Anybody recognize that boat? <laughs> yeah. Um, That was the chance two years ago. That's an actual sea. It doesn't look like one. It was very, very windy. It was actually kind of funny because on the day, I remember on the day we were racing, everybody said, oh, what a great day. It was only when we saw the photos with Pete and um, you were out in a rib, right? You and Joyce were out in a rib. And we all saw the photos and went, geez, it really was windy. And that wasn't just bar talk. OK, so. Um, Right, so Lama, very, very different story. So typical conditions in Lama, um, not really so significant tide, and the tide does fan um, uh, across the course. The, um, you know, in the harbor, you know, the tide is important, it's a, it's a key factor, but in Lama, um, Right. So everybody knows the race course, right? Okay, so the race course sort of you know, anywhere from here to here to here. Okay, so that's the Lama racetrack um, in general. Um, and the tide, you know, it fans, right? So, you know, the general, you know, filling tide, and it splits and goes up the main channel here, and goes across and goes down the channel there. There is no relief. You're just in it. Right? It's, you know, you can look at your instruments. When we sell big boats out there, for example, for China Coast, sometimes it'll tell you that there's like 0.4 difference one side to the other really seems that way. It's sort of you're sort of looking at instruments and you're not believing them, you know, sort of thing. But you know, we've never really noticed any significant tidal difference uh, one side or the other. Um, the left is just always good. Um, so you know, we'll explain why um, shortly. Okay. You do get tide on the starboard ley line, though, um, which can push you down to the north. In some conditions. That's very true. I'm not saying that there's no tide. I'm just saying I don't think there's any escape from it. You know what I mean? I think there's tide both sides. Um, it's, it's definitely obvious though when you do come into that top mark. You know, it can get quite exciting. You think you're pretty fine on it, and then oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah. So, okay. So, um, you know, funneling breeze generally from the vicinity of Beaufort Channel. Um, from 045 to 120 is absolutely typical, and there are waves. Nearly always, it seems, that the waves are different tack to tack. Okay? I don't know if everybody else remembers this, but what seems to happen is, on starboard, you seem to be very close to parallel to the waves. Right? So what that means is, if it's blowing 15 plus or 18 plus, it's fantastic. That's a really lovely ride. And, and off you go, and there's no bang, bang, you know, off you go. But if it's below that, it's like 12, it's brutal. Because, especially if it's like 8 to 10, it gets terrible. Because the apparent wind shift moves, the apparent wind moves so much <coughs> on your sail plan, you know. As you, as you basically get heeled over, right, then you get an apparent knock, right, and as you slide, you know, down the wave and the boat heels back over on top of you, you get an apparent lift. And it just, it sort of, it's, it's a desperately difficult feel to make sure you're powered up, you know, and have the right twist. Because as you get a big lift, you, you get the header, right, so you, your boat falls to leeward, you get an apparent wind header. So you sheet the main on, and you sheet the jib on, right, so that fits, and then whoo, the boat rolls back up, and you get the apparent wind lift, and you have to ease the sails so that you have enough twist that the sails don't stall. So you spend your entire beat trimming when you're going along on starboard. 
So, you know, generally what we would tend to do is we tend to set ourselves up a little flatter, you know, on that side. Um, jib cars aft a little, you know, perhaps one less chalk, um, you know, to sail along there. On port, you are in the kaboo. You know, you're chopping wood, um, and it's all about going fast, like really, really, really fast. So it's car forward, twist, traveler up, ease main sheet, bang, 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 bang. So a different <coughs> setup, uh, both sides. Um, the weird conditions in Lama are a southerly and a westerly, and I've absolutely no idea what to do in those conditions, because every time I've raced in Lama in those conditions, I've got carted. So if anybody else has any ideas on those, I'd love to hear them. Okay. Uh, the key geographic influences is Hong Kong Island to the north, um, and in particular the Stanley Headland and Violet Hill, um, and Lama itself from the perspective of splitting the tide. Um, and of course if there is a westerly. So, in Lama, as opposed to in the harbour, we're permanently set up to go as fast as humanly possible. Height is not a concern, it's all just about going fast. So, basically, uh, in order to go fast, you're going to be sailing a little fatter, a little lower. So, therefore, you need to generally depower the boat a little because you're going to be sailing a little further off the wind and therefore it's likely to heel over a little more. So, generally, we'd sail with tight lower or inner shrouds. Um, a shorter force day, because we're not so worried about having that extra weather helm for the height. Um, generally fuller sails, you know, with more twist. You know, for example, in the harbour, it's got to be six knots or less before we're letting off any outhaul, right? In Lama, it might be eight knots and we'd be letting off. We might even be in ten knots and we wouldn't be full outhaul, you know, in Lama. Uh, just because we're sort of reaching around, you know, a bit because it's all out there. Okay, so generally fuller sails with more twist. So uh, to deep power on the jib, for example, we'd be easing the sheet before we'd be moving the cars aft. Okay, so the opposite of the harbour. Um, going upwind, uh, again, on the mainsail, we'd have the traveller up above the centre line, and we'd be easing the sheet to deep power the main. So backstay, easing the sheet. Um, as opposed to leaving the sheet cleated and going traveller down, which we might in the harbour. Okay, generally we have we might be one chalk out, you know, or a little less, um, you know, mast ram, letting the middle of the mast bend forward a little more, which gives a little more force to sign. You just hike like the bejesus, right? It doesn't matter if it feels underpowered. You have just got to hike so hard because it's going to feel underpowered when you do the. Um, you do the going up the wave bit and you get rolled to leeward and you get the header and it'll feel like you're underpowered and then when you go over the wave and you come back up and you get the lift you've got to be fully hyped because when you get that lift and the boat powers up you must use that power to pop forward so just savage hiking um, at all times especially because your helmsman is footing uh, being at maximum crew weight is critical obviously I'm one of my areas of expertise here you know so all components of that, it's one of the best bits about sailing in Lama, is that once you've made the weight, you can just go bananas um, on not, food. Not bananas. Or not bananas, <laughs> that's right. Bananas on your pizza, maybe. Yeah, so in terms of technique, it's totally agricultural. So if in the harbour, the focus is on being smooth, you know, just reducing the friction on tiller extension, let the boat round up as the pressure comes on, forget it in Lama. Just chuck the boat around like a digger, right? It's just a matter of going super fast, super aggressive all the time. Because the waves are going to do that to you anyway. You can't be smooth, you know, if you're sailing in a plowed field. You know, it doesn't work. You know, if you're gliding along on ice, then everything's fantastic. You know, but, you know, once you're into the waves, it's going to be lumpy. So doing a bit of kicking around at the tiller is really not a problem. The key thing is to not be dictated to by the waves, it's to dictate yourself where your boat is going, to set it up properly. So we're sailing the boat a bit lower than normal, um, again, to go fast, right? And the reason for this is that as you go slower, it is harder to re-accelerate, okay? So if you're doing 10 knots and you drop, you know, to 9, you can get back up to 10 pretty quick. 
And if you're doing two and you drop to one, right, that's, that's well, we all remember it from Sunday. You know? If you're doing zero, minus. you know, that's right, minus, yes, I was there, you know. Um, so the key thing is to you sail it as fast as you possibly can, because then if you get a bad set of waves, your boat speed doesn't just drop off the face of the earth, it just drops a bit, right? So you can be sailing along, you know, with a guy, and you're going a little bit higher, and it feels fantastic, and same speed, a little bit extra height. But then the problem is you're sailing it right on the edge, and then you bam, 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 and this guy is not going bam, bam, he's going So when you bam, 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 you then have to pull the nose away to get the thing going, and all the height that you gained from your you know, minute or so of nice flat water, or smooth water, goes away instantly. Yeah. If you're in the bay in, in the waves and you want a time attack, yeah. What what is the best point to do it? Um, it'd be obviously finding as flat a spot as possible is is basically it. Um, I never actually you know in a swell right like a real big swell in like Clearwater Bay for example you get the big swells then the idea is to throw your taxi going down the wave, right? But in Lama. We've always found that it's not, there aren't really any length of swells to enable that. It's more of sort of choppy, you know, dishwashery kind of uh, water. Um, and so we'd just be trying to find as easy a spot as possible. I think the key thing would be that when you come out of the tack and your sails fill, that's when you want to be in the flat bit. I don't think it's actually when you put the helm over in the first place. You know, I think it's when... You know, you put the helm over, you're going through, it's then when you're at your sort of most vulnerable that you don't want to cop the, you know, the, the big smack. And of course, vice versa, if you're trying to shake a guy, right, it's a fabulous opportunity to throw your tack away from him when you can see that just in front of him is a horror set. You know, that's a, that's a really great um, opportunity. I think a lot of you, when you tack, you've got to get the right tack very right fast. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're just stuck at an angle on the heel, and you're just going sideways, parked up. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely agree. You just that's you just can't get out there, get the nose away, and get loaded, you know, as fast enough. Okay. If you're in any doubt, if you're if you're in Lama and you're not going well, okay, then the first thing to do is try easing your sheets and going even faster. Uh, even if it feels like you're already sailing really low. Sounds stupid, you know. And again, I'm all, you know, there's a happy medium here that we all keep searching for. But if in doubt, give it a try. You know, the faster you go, the more the foils are going to work. Right? That's just a fact. Right? Get your foils working. Your side slip drops away. Your leeway drops away, and you might actually wind up sailing higher. You know. Right? I mean, in the Etchells, for example, when we get out to Lama, because we only go there like twice a year and only once it's windy. Um, in fact, last year it was never windy in Lama, I seem to recall. We did a northwesterly for the class champs. But every time we go out there, in the first couple of races, you see everybody sailing really high in harbor mode. You know? And uh, uh, two years ago, actually, it was really interesting because Ante and his brother had just arrived in town. And they've been sailing in the Solent for many years, where it's lumpy and windy. And we all went out there and we just got smoked for the first couple of races until everybody remembered that, oh, oh yeah, 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 we're supposed to be going fast now. And then everybody started to uh, catch up again. Um, so yeah, if in doubt, ease the sails. You'll be very pleasantly surprised how little height you will lose um, when you start going faster. Oh, start. I mess up. Um, right, so Lama, boat set up. I'm sorry. Yes, okay, good. Okay, so in the strategy, Lama is go left. Okay. Um, okay. 
there are theoretical reasons uh, behind this. Um, physical uh, lessons. If the wind is moving off a shore, okay, and this is where the, you know, Vile Hill, Titan, Chung Hong Kok, you know, the Stanley Headland, etc., is really important. Um, if the wind is moving off a shore within, say, 30 degrees of perpendicular, okay, so uh, generally the south side of Hong Kong Island, you know, if this is sort of, you know, Ocean Park, Grand Island, etc., it sort of tends to run. Uh, a bit like that, okay. but the breeze is sort of like that. Well, ha what tends to happen is, as the east northeasterly blows, as it comes to this, it will try to blow at perpendicular to the land. Okay. Now, obviously, if it's blowing like this originally, it's not going to try it. But if it's within about, you know, sort of 30 degrees, it will change to blow perpendicular. So therefore what happens is, I thank my father, by the way, for reminding me of that this morning. Um, what will tend to happen here is, if we have a look at the, uh, the map again, Um, so this land here, so the, the breeze, uh, that's Beaufort. So here's Beaufort. And as we all know, you know, you get out here towards the start, somewhere around here, and you're sort of looking up, but the breeze sort of blows, you know, out of the channel. And then what tends to happen is because the earth, the land is generally, this is the line, if this is the standard sort of breeze, when it gets up here, it tends to bend like this, very, very locally. Okay? So as a result, the breeze tends to be a bit left in the left-hand side. It also comes down off the hill and accelerates right, where it hits the, uh, hits the ground, hits the water again. Okay? So often there's more pressure uh, on the left as well. There is one other a feature to this. Um, okay. So that's that's the bend due to the shape of the shoreline. So as a result, you're trying to sail inside the bend. Okay, so if in general, just for simplicity, the breeze is there and it's coming off like that down here. And the idea is that you when the breeze is this way, you're better off being on starboard. And when the breeze is that way, you're better off being on port. So basically what will happen is you sail nicely lifted, and then you get into this, you get not, and then you sail off again. So, so inside the bend, it's just that the bend is this way, rather than in harbour where the bend is that way. Okay, so again, we're just sailing up inside the bend. Um, you have to watch out for the sea breeze effect. Um, I know that there's no real visible sea breeze in Hong Kong like there is, um, you know, certainly in Ireland or in England, um, you know, where you'd see it being total glass out in the morning, and then the next second you see this line, this black line of pressure, you know, it's coming in towards the land. Um, we very rarely see that. I've seen it twice um, here in Hong Kong, um, but it does actually happen. There is a Chinese <coughs> University of Hong Kong paper, which is called The Study of the Sea Land Breeze System in Hong Kong, by a couple of very intelligent guys, and basically it explains to you the distribution of the sea breeze. So this is, if you imagine there's zero normal breeze, okay, then this is how the sea breeze will happen as the land heats up in Hong Kong. So this is Hong Kong Island, Beaufort and Potoys, Lama, Lantau. And basically what happens is, well, everybody knows this, you know, on a summer's day, right? If you're there, if you go across to Macau or Zhuhai, it's often just belting, you know, in, up there. 
when we do the Mears Bay race in the summer, we're always constantly amazed when you get up into Mears Bay how strong, you know, the, the southeasterly is, you know, up inside Mears Bay. Anybody who did the Mears Bay race this year, we started off with about six to eight knots. We all set VMG kites around uh, East Nine Pin, and then we had it off up there. By the time we got into Mears Bay, it was about 12 to 15 knots. We were all pulled back on an S2, you know, having a great time. So in the same way, um, there is actually a sea breeze. It just happens in a really weird way because basically here is an extremely steep landmass um, with a lot of uh, uh, faces that really point into the sun, you know, perpendicular early in the day and get very hot very fast. So this sea breeze, you know, does actually happen. We just don't tend to see it because we tend to be inside amongst the hills um, in central or elsewhere. And um, how this impacts the land breeze, of course, as well. How uh, this splits is basically that there is, it's sort of split into these segments. Um, so you can see that, you know, it just all blows in in a circle. So down here in Lama, we're in the area between this and this. Anybody who did China Coast Regatta this year will remember that on the second day the race course was set directly in the middle of two competing breezes. Remember? So as a result, we wound up having a very, very difficult day. But the guys in the cruising class who started and went off around Beaufort and Potoys sailed the entire day in 15 knots with beer in their hand. Okay? That again is just because of this incredible difficulty of the two, sea, the two different direction sea breezes. It's also why, of course, here in the summer, Quite often there's a great westerly down at the west end and a great easterly up at the east end, but here in the center on the Sunset Series course, it's a breathless, okay, because of the two sea breezes fighting each other. How that translates when you add it into the northeaster, which is when we tend to race in Lama, is what's really interesting. So this is the distribution of the sea breeze with the prevailing northeaster blowing. So as you can see, Again, here is Beaufort and Potoys, here is Lama, and so the sea breeze impacts by having the, you know, the sort of east, northeast out here, and then it starts to bend up into Lama Chana. Yeah? So, anybody do the Round the Island race on Sunday? You know, anything look familiar here? You know, so, you know, here we are. We, Sort of beef up, beat off out, port pole on the force day, a cracking run down Beaufort Channel. A um, couple of little flicky ones over the top here, where that breeze, remember we were talking about earlier on, tried to go perpendicular to the land shore. So all of a sudden we wound up whole hard on the force day. And then we actually got lifted and we were actually able to sail along quite a long way here with the A2, right? And then of course we got into not quite so much sea breeze because the northerly was strong enough to flick around the back. But that bend, is just basically because of a compromise of the standard northeaster uh, being impacted by the sea breeze. So again, a bend inside the left edge, um, exacerbated by um, a quick bullet of extra pressure um, on the left lane. I don't think these guys actually did this for sailors. I think it was for air pollution or the airport. Okay, so generally in the sea breeze um, world, if the breeze is left of 090, and this is very much at the end of the season or at the very start of the season, chances are that the breeze is going to persistently shift right of 090 at some stage, you know, during the day. Might be too late, might be when we're back in Middle Island having a drink, um, but there's a good chance that that will happen. If it is right of 090, there's a good chance that it'll flick back left at one point, but that'll be short, right? short term stuff. In general, nobody is surprised when the left wins. Now again, this is not just a llama thing, right? Very often, right? The vast majority of times, people, the winners come out of the left, right? And this is because if you've got a good start and you're in the front row, you can't really tack, because you'd have to sort of tack and duck 
people all of a sudden. So you sort of tend to keep going, right? If, on the other hand, you've got a lousy start, you tend to tack quite quickly, right? And you bail out to the right, but you're already behind. So even if from there on there's nothing in it in the course, right, or the wind or anything, the guys from the left are going to win, right, because they're already in the lead. Okay, so don't be confused by the fact that, you know, the winners come out of the left. It may not be that the left was good. It may just be that they're the best guys with the newest boats and the best start, and they were going fast. Okay? But in Lama, it's a, it's a big surprise if the right is a winner. Okay? Definitely watching out for the pressure on the left. And this is a bit of a sort of shelter cove thing or the harbour in a northerly, that if the breeze is left of 075, then it's starting to get within the 30 degrees where it does the flick over the hill bit, that there will very likely be more pressure on the left. If you're sailing along on starboard, sorry, if you're sailing along on port, right, below the ley line, and you see more pressure up to the left of you, and some guys on the rail say, more pressure to the left, it's coming down to us, it's not, right, it's just staying there, okay, because it's coming over the hill, hitting, and then going up again. So you have to tack to it, right? So, you know, when we're sitting on land, we try and set up below people, like say we get rolled or something. We're setting, we get as far left as we can, but then we have to bail out. We bail out. We're always just saying, are we off the edge? Are we off the edge? Are we off the edge? Can we go back? Any chance to go back? Is there a lane to go back? To get, you know, flip over even like 50 yards sometimes. Dave Uriev, a legend at this, right? He lived, he lived on the port ley line. Started at the pin, sometimes even outside the pin, didn't really matter, <laughs> and just went left, right? And that was it, and it was great. So, the pressure will not move to you, you must sail into it, well into it, okay? Tide is a factor, but again, seemingly a minor one. And we have the tracker from the Dragon Champs. Recently. Which basically show um, and one of their races. So everybody knows where we are, right? Start in the usual spot and mark, top mark A. So we know what it's going to like. <laughs> so, yeah, he got bounced. He had to do a spin or something, or he was over or something. Off everybody goes, and then people start to flip back, and you can see they got lifted as they went in, and then they come out and they start to get lifted again to the point where a bunch of people ever stand. It's a bit of a bun fact. Okay, so. That's, that's basically it. So, you know, it's, it's just it's the Ben story all over again. They start here, they get a bit of a lift, and then they tack out. Here's the leader. Tacks out. I don't know how that one, I think that's a bit of a typo, that one. Um, and then you get lifted on the way out again. So, that's it. So, on the run, do you also want to stay in this breeze? Um, on the right, so the, uh, when you're on the run, that's yeah. then on your right. If you're in a Magic or a JID, yeah. Yeah, not in a 15. Because in a 15, I mean, you come around the top mark, in 15 knots of breeze, you're just going straight down the run. Right? I mean, you guys are in 15, you guys are planing. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's any point at which the 15's heated up to get planing again, right? You basically come around the top mark, and if it's very light, you're steering with a true wind angle of, let's say, 135, and then the windier it gets, the deeper you run. Sure. That's all that happens. There's no point at which, let's say, for example, it gets to 15 knots, and you decide that instead of going down from 150 to 160, you're just going to heat it up and get on a plane and go. Is that correct? I don't remember 15s doing that. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember our class champs because we had a bit of a separation on, in most of the races um, uh, because it was probably so dead downwind to the uh, to the bottom mark that I actually uh, 
uh, I saw there's more wind on the, you know, which is always there. Yeah. So I kind of tried to go there. That it yeah. was hard to tell what actually really worked or not. Okay. Well, I, de I definitely, I, I definitely don't think a jibe set works in llama. Right. So that definitely would bear with your your point that you know if you come around the top mark, you know the, the pressure is out here. Yeah. It's just that you're never really going to sail reciprocal unless it's under 10 knots. It's true, true. Right, so basically if it's 10 knots, then yes, it'll be this way. But if it's windier than that, chances are you're steering here. I mean, yeah. I mean dragons, yeah. of course, are, you know, you basically, you know, you sort of come around the top mark, it doesn't really matter how windy it is, you just point it at the bottom mark. Um, because the boat isn't going to go any faster if you heat it up, it's not exactly a VMG weapon. Um, so you can see that this is basically all that happens in a Carl in D51, you know, just basically sends it off down the run, does it, chucks a jibe after about 150 yards, and, um, and that's it. So, you know, <coughs> basically all the winners just come around the top mark and point it at the bottom mark. And all the guys that are coming down the back of the fleet sail an angle because they think they're going to go faster, but they don't. Yeah. So we need the duetchels, you know. They're all sheds, you know. Relatively speaking, that's why I say a J80, a sports boat. You know, you're going to be heating it out to the right to stay in that line of pressure near the port lay line, right, and then driving back out of it. Some pretty random sailing there, eh? I know. I mean, it's, it was a fantastic championship. I mean, how many were there? Twenty-two or something? Seventeen. Seventeen. It's unbelievable. Brilliant. So, um, you know, there, you, there you go. Okay, so that's uh, that's the llama uh, plan. Okay, and that's just an expansion blow up of the uh, paper. Okay, I mean again, you know, here this was the champs two a year and a half ago, and uh, you know again, I mean the committee, the race officer, just kept setting the boat end more and more biased, you know, to the point here where Peter Alston just couldn't believe his luck. This was his first time ever doing an actual class champs. It's like ten degrees boat biased. And he's just, you know, he just cruises in in this borrowed boat, comes around the committee boat, and just, just, I mean, he's launched. You can see he's launched. He was like last within, you know, half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Because everybody else just got into, you know, everybody else is further north than him, got into that extra pressure and sailed around. So, you know, that's good. the good race officers set, you know, very neutral or boat end lines in Lama just to see, you know, <laughs> who will be, you know, how much are people prepared to give away and um, to start down by the pin. It's funny, the island looks very low. Yeah, yeah, my problem, is, it? is that llama? <laughs> See, that could be lying. You know, I mean, that could be Australia or something. <laughs> but anyway, we've all traveled that <laughs> Okay, so in terms of tactics in llama, you know, take the bias on the line, you know, but focus on having a lane you can hold um, so that you can get left, okay? In particular, if you can find somebody that you are very confident is not as fast or as high as you, then starting above them is a good idea, okay? Just because you just want to be able to get left, like, you know, don't start above Mark Thornborough, okay? Big tip, okay? Because that's, you're not going to be able to live there sort of thing. Um, it, as opposed to in the harbour, where ruthless behaviour is, is worth it, uh, in Lama it's not. Um, bouncing a guy is not going to kill him. Right? If you're in the harbour and you bounce a guy back out into the current, it's going to kill him. Right? Fact. If you're in Lama, if you bounce a guy and he has to sail 80 yards and then come back, it's not going to kill him. But you can be assured 
that nearly the entire fleet is going to be in the vicinity of the port ley line on most first beats. And if you've got five races or three races into a series and you've spent the previous nine or ten beats bouncing people, you're not going to find a lane. Okay? So in general, in Lama, it pays over the course of a series to be a little more gentlemanly about the entire thing. So for example, if you cross a guy, you know, go, say, three lengths and loose cover. Okay? Obviously, it gets later in the series, it doesn't really matter so much. But at the start, you know, definitely uh, try not to upset everybody. You can still be aggressive in terms of achieving your tactical goal. Okay? So, you know, heading out to the left, you know, you're coming back on port, do leave out a guy. Right? No need to duck him. Do leave out the guy and make him have that horrible feeling as he goes along in the waves that he can't pull the nose away. Because if he pulls the nose away, you're there. Okay. Except on the last beat, of course, where you want the starboard advantage. So do duck a guy in that case. Uh, and off wind, you know, protecting your air is important. Uh, you know, very important. Again, for the reason that it's important to have that lane um, so that you don't have to separate away from people. Okay. Jive said it's generally not good. One thing in, in Lama that we learned many years ago that's really, really important is when you come around the top mark, um, it's, if, if you, especially if it's windy, right, let's say it's over, say, 12, 15 knots, so you're sort of like really pressed. If you overstand by, say, a length, okay, as opposed to reaching in before you get to the top mark, so you go really close to the mark, Keep that length in the bag, okay? Because then when you get to the point where you're, the end of your boo passes the buoy, you can smoke the main sheet completely, instantly, which will enable you to turn dead downwind. Okay? So, um, because <coughs> often you're going to catch a big wave you know, right there, and just make that initial surge away. If you, for example, right, here's, the, here's the wind blowing into the top mark. Can't do backhand, sorry. Um, if you're coming in high of the ley line, high of the ley line, so you would be going here, as opposed to doing this, right? Because when you get here, you won't be able to let the boom out until you are totally past the mark. Because right? you're right there and your boom will hit it. So you let the boom out, and by the time you do that, you're sort of here. If a guy comes around inside you, or a guy comes around and he holds the height, well, what he can do is when he gets to here, that's, that's our length, right? he can smoke his main sheet completely and come down inside. It's a fabulous situation if you've come around behind a guy, right, and all of a sudden you're going down on starboard, you know that situation, you know, pull out to weather, boat rolling on top of you, pumping hard, and he's here, right, he's still ahead of you, but he's pinned, right, he can't jive, okay, so it's a really, if you can basically steer, this is even while the spinnaker is being hoisted, you can just get dead downwind, right, You'll have all your upwind momentum, you'll catch a wave, and off down inside a guy. It's just a shocker being outside being hit. So, you know, uh, the America's Cup boats, in the old days when they used to have booms, um, were really good at this, that they'd be, you'd, you'd see them all coming to the top mark, and they'd be like a full boat length high, just so that they could smoke the main and get off downwind so they didn't get pinned. Because obviously in a, in a match race, you know, if you're pinned, it's game over. It's not like a fleet race where you've got loads of guys to take care of if the guy pins you in a match race, your history. So Jamie, would you would you suggest to go to the extreme of deliberately doing that? Or yeah, we all deli deliberately over overstanding? We will try and do it so that literally or, when we we'll just err on that always just you know we'll I mean 
we're always trying to put about a, a length in the bag in Lama anyway, because that boy seems to jump around a lot, you know? Yeah, so uh, we never hit it. But um, yeah, we put one in the bag. I'd put a boom length in the bag. You know, I'd keep a boom length in the bag so that as we bear away to like a beam onto the wind, I can have the boom like pretty much fully out, so I'm not having to wind the tiller. I'm just able to, you know, the boat just flattens out and pff, off we go. I know that I just, I always remember the look on like Jerry Shutt's face, you know, when he'd go round the top mark ahead of us, screwing for Mark, and then, you know, we'd turn left and we'd be inside him. And it was, you know, it was a sense of deep depression you could see on his face, which was a good way to go after he'd smoked us up the beat. So. Um, right, that's all I've got. Any questions? Who else, who's racing in Lama for the rest of the season? Anybody? Like right out in Lama, any champs left? Etchell's champs left. When's that? 17, 18. It's freezing, right? Christmas champs. Cool. So you, you'd ignore the tide, do the same thing, whatever the tide. In Lama? Yeah. Yeah. Apart from the top mark, you've got to remember you're going to be taking down on it. That's right, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, I remember one time we did have a, like a southwesterly, you know, in Lama in March or something, and uh, and then the tide was a big deal. Right? Because we were actually like sort of going south of Lama and getting into the full set. But in the normal little, you know, sort of polygon that we race in, um, I would say that there is not enough impact from the tide to have it influence my positioning on the racetrack relative to other boats. Whereas in the harbour, you're going to be four lengths away from a guy, and it's fundamental. I mean, in shelter, for example, there's tide in shelter. You know, surprising. You only really notice it when you chuck an anchor out to go swimming and discover you're 50 yards behind the boat. But when you're, uh, but it's not a tactical consideration because there's no escape or any benefit um, anywhere. How about the China Coast, the last day when we started from the end, the channel? Yeah, how cool was Where's that? The side is better. Yeah, and left was better. Yeah, a lot. Again, I did the standard. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. I really, really enjoyed that. I was sort of wondering why we've never raced there before. Can we do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, it was belting down Beaufort Channel. I, I thought that was brilliant racing. And I'm still not really sure which side was better. I definitely know that on the, whatever day we did the race up to TCS2, the sort of one that went weird at the top, um, that the left was way better. But on the last day, when we had the three windward lures at the foot of Beaufort Channel, it was, you know, it was, there, were, there were slots everywhere, you know. It was, a bit, it was a bit ugly, right in under Beaufort, near Castle Rock. Yeah. It was a bit light, and oh god, we're never getting out of here. But um, yeah, I thought that was a brilliant racetrack. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Dave. Great, Dave. Welcome.